Well, good morning. You can open up your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you can find one under seats nearby. And this text is on page 1006 in those, um, in those Bibles. And so, a reminder of what we do in this uh, portion of our service. Um, by the way, I was just sitting here this morning thinking, what a privilege it is to be here. You know, we open the service with that text of Scripture from Isaiah. We didn't make that up. We're just born into a world where this reality is here, where God has come to save us. Uh, I didn't write these songs, but get to sing them. Those who wrote the songs were thinking they didn't have, they didn't have to make things up. But these are given realities we get to sing about. And so, with preaching as well, my job is not to make something up to entertain or make us all excited and happy, but to hear God's Word, because it's already written. And so, that's what we're doing here. So, we do what's called expositional preaching. So, we take the text, we read it, we look to the Lord to change us in light of it as we hear its message. So, the point of the text is typically the point of the sermon. So, let's uh, pray together because what we're doing in this time is we're engaging with the God who made us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for giving it to us to have it translated in our language so that we can hear Your voice this morning. And so, we pray that Your Spirit would give our minds understanding and transform our hearts We pray that you would do all the things that only you can do and that you love to do and that we need you to do. Convict us of sin, encourage weary hearts, comfort those who are sorrowing and suffering, and most of all, help us have joy in you through Jesus and by the Spirit. Amen. Well, we're remembering and celebrating Advent, or the arrival of Jesus into the world. And we're calling this uh, series right now uh, through Advent Fulfilled because Jesus came to fulfill all of God's promises and in doing so, fulfill our deepest longings. So, Advent is part of a long story that goes from the beginning of creation all the way to the new creation to come. And in the Old Testament, God was preparing people to understand Jesus when He came. So, the book of Hebrews we've been seeing in this series shows us that Jesus came to fulfill the central themes in the Old Testament. So, we've seen how He fulfilled the themes of priesthood and covenant and the tabernacle and temple. And this morning, we'll see how He fulfills the theme of sacrifice. So, this morning, we're seeing from Hebrews 10 how Advent, Christmas, is connected to Jesus' death or Good Friday. So, Hebrews 10 teaches us that Jesus came into the world to die. And this means that when we think about Advent, we're actually not so far from thinking about Good Friday. And this is because Jesus' own life was a story. His incarnation and birth and His life and His death and His resurrection and His ascension his future return. This is all part of a story. And so, when we celebrate Jesus' birth at Advent, we'll actually miss the point of Advent if we don't plug it in to this bigger story. And so, this is one way that we see how Advent actually connects with us today. So, as we come to the end of the year, many of us around this time of the year start looking backward at the past months, this past year. We remember the things we've done. So, maybe you have already been thinking about ways that you've hurt somebody. You've said things that you can't take back, maybe done irreparable damage. Maybe you go to bed sometimes with a sense of self-loathing, or you carry around a weight of guilt, or maybe it comes in waves, or maybe you have real guilt, but you have grown numb to it, but one day you'll stand before God. So, what does Christmas have to do with that? Well, that's what our text will show us this morning. So, Hebrews 10 is here to show us that Jesus came into the world at Advent to deal with our deepest problems. So, my hope this morning is that we would all believe and re-believe. For those of you who trust in Jesus, that we would believe afresh this morning in the good news of Advent and that we would personally engage with Jesus Himself 
as our Savior. So here's the point of the text, and then we'll read it. Jesus came as the final sacrifice to give us full forgiveness. So let's read this together. We'll read um, the first 14 verses of chapter 10. I think we have 18 listed on the screen, but we'll just do the first 14 this morning. So Hebrews 10, this is God's Word. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, so because of this, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 11, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So Jesus came as our final sacrifice to bring full forgiveness. So this text has three movements of thought, so we'll just follow those. We'll see the law's repeated sacrifices, Jesus' final sacrifice, and the difference between the two. And then from there, the difference for all of us. So first, the law's repeated sacrifices. Now remember, Jesus' arrival came in the midst of a story, and it's a story that God was unfolding in history revealing it to the Jewish people. So, He gave them this whole system of sacrifices to deal with sin, but those sacrifices were never intended to be the final answer. They foreshadowed, and they pointed to Jesus. And so, the author of the book of Hebrews is bringing this up to make the point that the sacrifices, all of them, any one of them, all of them together were inadequate. And that was God's intention. He was preparing people to understand what Jesus was came to do when he finally arrived. So, this is verse 1. You can look at it again with me. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So, how does the Old Testament relate to the New Testament? Like shadows relate to a substance that cast them. So, this is saying, if you look, you look at the Old Testament and you are seeing shadows, the substance is Jesus. So, Scripture is like this. So, you have an open Bible in front of you, hopefully. Uh, on the right side of that Bible is the New Testament, right? And Jesus is standing up on the right side of the Bible, on your lap there. Um, and he's casting a shadow. So there's a flashlight, picture of flashlight shining on Jesus, casting a shadow on the Old Testament. And what do we see when the shadow of Jesus is cast on the Old Testament? Well, what's interesting is he casts a number of shadows. It's not his body. He casts one shadow, which is a silhouette of a building, a tent, a tabernacle. And then there's another shadow, which is a priest. 
and another shadow, which is a lamb and a goat offered as a sacrifice, and many more shadows, kings and prophets and so forth. Now, before Jesus came, the people only had the shadows to see. They're looking at the shadows of these things. And they were waiting for Jesus. He's the true tabernacle, the true presence of God. He's the true priest who offered himself as the true sacrifice. So I picture like this. I guess it's a good Sunday for this illustration, although maybe I'm dating myself. Kids, ever watch Tom and Jerry? Okay, ask your parents. Yeah, classic. It's good stuff. Um, so Tom and Jerry, Tom's chasing Jerry. And maybe I'm conflating this with our cartoons. This is kind of a classic storyline that's in a lot of these. So Tom, this cat's chasing this little mouse. Mouse disappears for a while, goes through a hallway. All of a sudden, there's a big shadow in front of Tom. It's like a monster. Big teeth, claws. Tom's freaked out. He wants to give up the chase. And then he kind of looks around the corner, and it's just the little mouse right? There's a shadow being cast, and the little tiny mouse was able to cast a big shadow of this monster that freaked Jerry out. So, Jesus is like that, but actually kind of the opposite. Um, He's casting his shadow on the Old Testament, but it's better. It's the real thing because it's Jesus. Now, if you miss this, you'll think that the Old Testament is basically irrelevant today. You'll think that the Old Testament was just about temples and priests and sacrifices. Then Jesus gets rid of all that because it's all kind of outdated. But no, Jesus does end all of that because he fulfills it. It was all teaching about him, and therefore it still teaches about him. Jesus is the main point of history. And so God, ahead of time, had Christ cast his shadow on the Old Testament backward in history. And part of that shadow is what we're looking at this morning, which is the sacrificial system. And I love how the author refers to what Jesus has brought. He's foreshadowing the good things to come that have come now. So, what are the good things that Jesus brings? My boys sometimes make Christmas lists of things that they would like to get. And they sometimes haven't just written words, but they'll draw little pictures. And those pictures are nice, right? But if I just gave them the picture of that, that wouldn't be fulfilling. It's just a picture of a good thing to come that they hope is to come, right? It's a sketch. So Jesus is the good thing to come, and he brings the good things to come. So what are those good things? Well, the point of this text is that he brings the final sacrifice that can cleanse us from sin. Notice in verse 1 again what the sacrifices couldn't do. They couldn't make perfect those who draw near. So, perfection here is about having sins removed. The sacrifices were pictures of that. The person would take an unblemished animal, depending on the offering, and press their hand down on the head of that animal. It's a way of identifying with that animal. It's going to take that person's place and transferring their sins to that animal. And then that unblemished animal would be sacrificed for their sins. Or on the Day of Atonement, one would be sent far away, carrying the sins away. So, the perfect animal received sins, took the punishment that we deserve of death and banishment from God's presence. And so, the imperfect person then is viewed as perfected. And the author is saying that was all a shadow. Didn't really work in and of itself. It didn't actually remove sins. How do we know? Verses 2 to 4 show his argument. Otherwise, he says, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So the fact that they had to repeat this showed that it wasn't perfecting the people. And they're just bulls and goats anyway. And so the result is that the people were just reminded of sin year after year. It was teaching them that a greater sacrifice was needed and a greater sacrifice was coming. And so, look at verse 2 again. Do you see what the hope was? It was that they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. That language is about being conscious of our guilt. It's about feeling deep down guilty and unclean. The blood of animals cannot calm an accusing conscience. So, this is touching on a universal human issue. 
We all have a sense of guilt and shame from our sins. What do we do with that? How do we get it to go away? Is it possible? If you're not a Christian, how do you handle that? How have you tried to cover over that feeling or atone for yourself? Many people try to live a good enough life over time to have a sense of outweighing the wrong they've done, like repeated sacrifices over and over. They do repeated acts of goodness, but they know, you maybe you know, it's never enough. The fact that you have to keep going shows that it's not working, just like in the Old Testament. They had to keep offering the sacrifices because it wasn't ultimately working. You never can feel deeply assured that God loves you. Or maybe you alternate between two kinds of perspectives. Sometimes you feel like you're too far gone and there's no hope of forgiveness for you. There's no hope of a cleansed conscience. There's no hope that God will accept you. You've done too much, too bad, and so you feel hopeless. And maybe you're even here on Sundays regularly and you read your Bible and pray, but you know and assume that you're just beyond God's grace. But then at other times, and perhaps in a psychologically complex way at the same time, at another layer down, you feel like you're actually probably okay because you're not as bad as a lot of other people. You watch the news. You see how bad people can be. You're not making the headlines. And so you figure that you're okay. And you try to get that sense of okayness to calm your conscience. But in either case, what you're doing is you're trying to compensate for your sin by, with your own subjective sense of morality. And it's not working because that's not how it works. We have real objective guilt, and it's weighing down our conscience, and we need to have our sins removed. So God gave Israel the sacrificial system to teach them that a final sacrifice was needed, and it was coming. Okay, so that's the law's repeated sacrifices. Now we move then, second, to Jesus' final sacrifice. So the author presents Jesus' coming into the world at Advent and making an announcement. So what's the announcement that Jesus makes when he comes into the world? Well, that he would not only bring a final sacrifice, but that he would be the final sacrifice. So look at verses 5 to 7. It says that Jesus took up Psalm 40 on his own lips. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, so now this is quoting Psalm 40, and the author's saying, this is on Jesus' own lips now. Sacrifices and burnt offerings you, so picture the son praying to the father, sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you've prepared for me. So the father has prepared a body for the son. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it's written of me in the scroll of the book. So when it says, when Christ came into the world, that's Advent. It's what we refer to as the incarnation. Jesus, the eternal divine Son of God, God the Son, came into the world as a human being. He's truly God and truly man. And at least one time each Advent, I feel like I have to carry on R.C. Sproul's soapbox about this. We don't use the language of fully God and fully man because we're not dealing in percentages here, right? It's not like, well, he's not 50-50, it's not 70-30, it's not 100-0, it's 100-100. It's, he's truly God, truly man. Christ came into the world, the eternal Son of God, truly God, truly man. And he came into the world with a mission to accomplish that he announced. And he announced it with the words of Psalm 40. Jesus came as the one true final sacrifice. And the result of that sacrifice is that those who trust him, right, like those people in the Testament who put their hand on the animal, those who trust him, we, we, as it were, put our hand toward the cross, recognizing He is our offering. We're fully and finally, decisively forgiven. Our sins are removed. That's why Advent happened. So when we think about Christ coming into the world, the nativity scenes, and the little baby Jesus, 
We remember that he came as a child, but Christmas can drift into sentimental religiosity if we unplug it from this bigger story. Jesus came to be the final sacrifice. So we've seen the law's repeated sacrifice sacrifices and Jesus' final sacrifice. Now third, the difference between the two. And that's what the author summarizes in verses 11 to 14. Several contrasts. So look first in verse 11, what the previous sacrifices were like. And every priest stands daily at his service. So the priests are standing there every day doing their thing, offering repeatedly over and over and over the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now look at the contrast with Jesus' final sacrifice in verses 12 to 14. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he didn't keep standing to keep offering this. What did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God. It's a metaphor referring to him being done with his work and being exalted to the place of authority and power and kingship where he's ruling right now, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified or are being sanctified. Now, so instead of repeated sacrifices, he offered for a single time a sacrifice. Instead of standing, he sat down because his work's done. Instead of being ineffective, this sacrifice works. He's perfected us. Sin's removed. And we're passive in this salvation. Do you see that? Jesus came. Jesus announced his mission. He gave his life. He rose again. He sat down. And the result is that our sins are removed. Now, who gets in on this? Well, anyone who receives this by faith, it doesn't apply to everyone. It applies to those for whom he died. And these are those who come to him in faith. But to come to him in faith is simply to receive this. It's to acknowledge that you need this sacrifice. And you receive it with empty hands of faith. He did the work. We receive it. That's the meaning of Advent. So what does this mean for us today? A few implications here. First, Trust Jesus as your final sacrifice. He's the only sacrifice you will ever need. Many people in the world still offer animals as sacrifices for atonement. Interesting enough, the Jewish people stopped offering animal sacrifices when the temple was destroyed, and now they offer prayer as a kind of sacrifice. Secular people also have their sacrifices. We all feel the need for atonement and cleansing, and so we attach ourselves to a cause. We seek to do good, seek to compensate, but no sacrifice will work. We have real guilt before a real God, and Jesus came to absorb that. So receive it. Press your hand toward the cross and let Jesus have his death count for you. So if you've not received this sacrifice I just encourage you to, you can tune me out for the rest of this time. Go to God. He has his ear toward you. Turn to him. Put out empty hands of faith and receive the cleansing of your conscience. Receive the removal of all the guilt from every sin you've ever done. Draw near to him. And if you're not sure about all this yet, I encourage you to keep exploring Jesus. Read one of the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John in the Bible. If you don't own a Bible or you don't have one that's easy to read, please take the one that you're you know, holding or that was around a seat nearby you or grab one before you leave. It's a gift to you. Um, please just take it and it's yours and get to know Jesus. Second, let's honor Jesus for his sacrifice. And I mean by this, let's not just treat this as an abstract message. This isn't just kind of a mechanical salvation project process. It's not just, you know, we have sin, we need atonement, God set up this mechanism of sacrifice, let's get the transaction done, move on with our lives. No, forgiveness is not an end in itself. We are forgiven so that we can know and enjoy our Maker. 
the triune God of love, Father, Son, and Spirit, so that we can know and enjoy the risen Jesus who is right now seated at that place of authority. So this Advent, let's remember baby Jesus, but let's draw near to the risen Christ. Third, let's not get bored with Advent or the sacrifice of Jesus. Um, If you've been around Christianity for a while, this message is not new to you. This is another angle on the heart of the gospel. And we can get so used to this that it can kind of become dull and boring to us. So how do we not get bored with this message? Well, for one thing, remember, even just right now, remember how much you need that sacrifice. Forgiveness of sins stops affecting our hearts when we lose touch with our need for this. We minimize the wonder of Jesus and Advent and the cross and resurrection and so forth when we minimize the weight of our sin. So the gospel often, for people when they come to believe, it starts off as thrilling news, and then it moves to decent news, and then it moves to old news. And then we can hear this and say, okay, another Advent message. Oh my goodness, it's about the cross. We get this on Good Friday and Advent, and basically every other Sunday, and we don't see the big deal with it. Um, Our family went ice skating a couple days ago. Anyone go ice skating so far this year? few? It's too bad. I guess that's me most years. Um, well, what if, what if I bumped into someone? I didn't. Uh, but let's say I, I bumped into someone, little bump, and I said, oh, sorry about that. Um, and they didn't get knocked over or anything. It was like a nudge, right? But I'm like, I'll be nice. I'm apologizing. And they say, with great sincerity, weight of the moment, I forgive you. You don't worry about it. Um, I, you were released from whatever burden of guilt you feel. Um, totally forgive you. I'm like, okay. Uh, moving on my way, and then later we're in the parking lot, we're getting ready to go, and we see that lady again, and she's like, I just, I don't know what's been, if it's been on your mind and weighing you down for a while, I just want to reassure you you've been forgiven. I'd be like, I don't think I'm the one with the problem here, actually, right? <laughs> like, what is going on? Um, but what if the offense was greater, right? And what if it was against someone you loved? What if you're driving and you saw someone you loved and respected and you hit them with your car on accident and the rest of their life they couldn't walk and had other complications? How would you feel? Terrible guilt from moments like that. Some of you live with terrible guilt from moments like that. You've sincerely apologized, and it still weighs on you. And the family has said to you, you are forgiven. And then you ran into them five years later, and they said, I just want you to know, you are still forgiven. Like, wouldn't that just be such a relief? So what's the difference? Well, in one scenario, you don't think it was a big deal, because it wasn't. So if we treat the gospel like that, Yeah, Advent, here it comes, here it goes. Jesus, great, forgiveness, got it. But if we don't lose touch of the reality of the offense, the repeated offense that we have lived with against our Maker, in this past week, this morning perhaps, um, if we don't lose touch of that, then forgiveness will be no light thing to us and we'll continue to be grateful and the news will never get old. The triune God of love made us, and we have rejected Him. No sacrifice could remove our guilt, and even as Christians, we still sin. We're still aloof from Him. We still neglect Him. We still love His gifts more than Him sometimes. Jesus came into the world to announce that He came to give His body as an offering. He has secured our forgiveness we can be reconciled to God. Worlds apart from Santa Claus theology, elf on the shelf theology, right, of a God who's just like looking to see if we're good enough to get some presents or something like this. Worlds apart from that. Fourth, bring your sins to Jesus. Some of you don't minimize your sin like I've been mentioning here. You feel the weight of it, but you live with guilt. You believe at one level that God's forgiven. You've confessed it. 
You've received forgiveness, but you still carry the guilt. The letter of Hebrews that we're reading here has, was written to free people from what the author calls repeatedly the consciousness of sin. That's that guilt that weighs us down on our conscience and is like a barrier between us and God. It's this sense of condemnation for our wrongs. So for some of you, you don't minimize your sins. You do see the seriousness of it, but you do the opposite of minimizing your sins. You minimize God's grace. You may not feel like you do, but you do. You don't really believe deep down God's word when he says you are forgiven and the sacrifice of Jesus was enough. So some of you maybe have had a season of great immorality in your past, or after 30 years of being a Christian, you still landed in the same mess of your own sin, or you've done one act that really damaged relationships that you can't undo, and now you beat yourself up over it. You feel condemned. Your conscience accuses you. You think that God's basically steady state disappointed with you. So what do you need? Well, you may need to see the weight of your sin, but you need to see the wonder of Jesus' sacrifice afresh. Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century pastor wrote a devotional book called Evening by Evening. Christine and I have different seasons of life read the evening devotions um, before bed. And here's what he said in one of those um, that I remember writing down. I've gone back to a lot over the time. He said this, you may look, study, and weigh, but Jesus is a greater Savior than you think him to be when your thoughts are at their greatest. My Lord is more ready to pardon than you are to sin, more able to forgive than you are to transgress. That's Jesus. He was a willing sacrifice. I mean, that announcement, a body you've prepared for me, what a weighty, serious thing, but he did it, Hebrews said, for the joy set before him. That joy includes you, being thrilled to receive a cleansed conscience from him and for you living in his love and knowing that you are welcome in his heart and in his home. So what do you do when your conscience accuses you then? You don't say, well, that's clearly just God wanting me to feel lousy for the rest of my life for this. No, you talk to your soul. You preach to your conscience. You get the gospel into it. You get your feelings in line with reality as God says it is. So what happens when your conscience keeps accusing you of sins you've already confessed to God? Now, if it's accusing you of sins you've not confessed, take those to God, repent, confess, receive fresh forgiveness. But what about when you've already done that? So your conscience accuses you and you say, what of it? And then your conscience says, you sinned. You're like, so what? Not that it's not a big deal, but it's dealt with. I don't, I don't need to feel bad about this anymore. Jesus died for me. He forgave me. I don't need to be burdened by your accusations all the time anymore. And then your conscience says, but you deserve to be condemned. You're enjoying Jesus too much here. And you say, Jesus was condemned for me. He's my final sacrifice. And you move on. You go ice skating or something. Finally, who needs to hear this good news? This is a message, and I'm asking that for you to ask. Who in your life needs to hear this good news? There are so many people in your life and mine who do not know this. Maybe they've actually grew up in church, they've been to church, they think they know this, they think they've heard this, but they either haven't heard it or it's not dropped in. They don't really know this. So, don't write off people who maybe have experienced Christianity and have kind of rejected it. Engage with conversations about who they think the real Jesus is, what they think Advent is and Christmas are really about. Because you'll find that the Jesus they're rejecting, you probably reject too. Because the Jesus they have in their mind isn't this one, isn't this one that liberates our consciences so that we're restored to Him. So, just end, end with this question. Who's one person, maybe they've already come to your mind, one person in your life who needs to hear this message before the end of the year? Pray for that person. 
And what's one step you can take to help get that message to them? And pray the Lord would do what only He can do. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the willing sacrifice of Jesus. Thank You for preparing a body for Him. Lord Jesus, we thank You for coming and announcing Your willing sacrifice for us. You didn't have to do this, but You have a a love that's greater than we can imagine. And Holy Spirit, thank You for opening our eyes and hearts to understand and receive this. So, Father, we pray now that You would fill us with all joy and hope in believing. Fill our hearts with joy as we sing now about the gospel and to You. And we pray that as this room is filled with people that are thinking of one person who needs to hear this message, we pray that You would surprise us this next week by bringing people to Yourself or closer to Yourself. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.